the retrospective exhibition entitled "Passages" at the Metropolitan Museum of Manila is a tribute to Betsy Westendorp and her distinguished career as an artist in Spain and in the Philippines. Miss Westendorp, who recently turned 93, has journeyed through a life full of both triumphs and tragedies, surrounded by love. And sustained by her consummated passion for her art, her life story begins in December 14, 1928, in the small village of Aravaca, just nine kilometers from the center of Madrid, Spain. Betsy's father, Carlos Westendorp, who was of Spanish-Dutch heritage, and her mother, Isabel Cabeza, named her after a grandaunt, Betsy Westendorp Oshek. Who was also an artist. Growing up, Betsy was sketching and drawing most of the time with her crayons, pencils, and paints. She slowly discovered her gift and talent in capturing the likeness of people. Not surprisingly, her first subjects were the family members, who endured the many sittings with Betsy, her mother and protective grandmother. Preferred she was tutored by professional artists in their own home. Later on, she would be allowed to attend studio classes of well-known portrait painters. At age 21, Betsy met and fell in love with a Spanish Filipino named Antonio Brias. After a whirlwind courtship, they were married in 1951. Antonio brought his new bride to the Philippines in the same year. Thus began the life of Betsy Westendorp in the Philippines, her adopted country. Betsy and Antonio Brias were blessed with three beautiful daughters: Isabel, Silvia, and Carmen. As Betsy settled in her new home in Manila, she would continue to paint and do charming portraits of her friends. She would later receive prestigious commissions from local prominent persons in business and politics, as well as renowned personalities who admired her elegant style of painting. What launched Betsy's career as a portraitist in Europe was her first portrait of the young Felipe VI, second in line to the Spanish throne, after his father, then Príncipe de España. Juan Carlos. Betsy was invited in 1970 by then Philippine ambassador to Spain Luis Gonzalez and his wife Vicky Quirino, daughter of former President Elpidio Quirino, to hold an exhibition of her works as part of the Philippine Week celebrations in Madrid. It was then that she was introduced to Spanish royalty, who asked her to do several portraits. For the royal family. When, uh, commenting about my painting, he said they are only flowers. You know, flowers is one of the most beautiful creatures in the world. So why say it's only a flower? For my goodness, only a flower. That's a wonder. Apart from portraiture, another defining theme of Betsy Westendorp's art is her flowers. Her first subjects were the roses and carnations that were gifted to her. Eventually, she painted her flowers en plein air, outdoors, on the spot where they actually grew. Betsy has always believed that, just like getting to know a person. She needed to be in the presence of her floral subjects. Betsy's first orchid paintings were inspired by a visit to a greenhouse in Madrid called Borgignon. Betsy loved even more the many tropical species of orchids that grow all over the Philippines. It was the late Elena Flores, the distinguished Spanish critic, who christened the heretofore prosaic series. Cloudscapes, with something that transcended the visible world. Flores ascribed the series the label "atmosferografias," 
in the words of Flores, a celestial panorama of its atmospheric state, to an artist who knows how to interpret it. Clouds that collide in a mysterious commotion of colors, siennas, blues, dark and light, crimsons, mauves, greens, ochres, golds. They have phantasmagoric shapes, fleeting, dense, evanescent, lightweight, changing in their constant and surprising movement. There are sunrises and sunsets, with the decline of light among the mist, the reflections of the sky on the sea. At several points in her life, Betsy has had her share of personal tragedy. Her husband Antonio died in 1976. In 2007, the death of her grandson, Ian, brought such deep grief and sadness for Betsy. In 2016, she received the heartbreaking news of the death of her daughter, Isabel. Betsy turned to her art again and again to transmute all her losses and her pain and produced a series of large atmosferografias. One of these works she titled Passage, a transitioning of life into another. She has since donated this work to the Instituto Cervantes de Manila. The Philippine government has acknowledged the important contribution of Betsy Westendorp to the enrichment of Philippine art by bestowing on her the Presidential Award of Merit for Art and Culture. The Spanish government also officially recognized the work of Betsy Westendorp. In 1976, the King of Spain, Juan Carlos, bestowed on Betsy the Lazo de la Orden de Isabel la Católica. To quote art critic and writer Sid Reyes, All of Betsy's life has been a celebration of her art. Her art was the one true source of unending joy, delight, and happiness, all of which are reflected in her numerous artworks in various genres. A very good morning to all of you. The Metropolitan Museum of Manila welcomes you to our new series of conversations on how art inspires and how it sparks the imagination and stir passions to create and to see beyond the obvious. We envision engaging and insightful lectures, interviews, and roundtable discussions with artists, curators, scholars, writers, and art enthusiasts as they elucidate on the processes of artists, their experiences, and trending topics in art and culture, referencing a work or a body of works from the museum's collection and exhibitions. We launch this morning the first in a series of Art Inspires with a focus on select artworks of Miss Betsy Westendorp from her ongoing retrospective exhibition entitled Passages, currently showing at the ground floor galleries of the museum. And with us this morning is Miss Betsy Weldon, sorry, Miss Denise Weldon Minyana, who is an artist, photographer, whose works belong to the institutional and private collections, and who was exhibited extensively in very prestigious galleries in and around Manila and overseas. Miss Weldon converses with Miss Alec Abaro, Deputy Director for Education Programming of the Museum, on the subject of beyond realism and more than what meets the eye. Let us all welcome Ms. Denise Weldon and Ms. Alec Abaro. Hi, Ms. Denise. Hi, good morning. Good morning and good morning, Ms. Tina. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. 
So most of us haven't gone to museums for a very long time. And we hope that this event will make us all feel as if we're just going around the Met. How was your week, Miss Denise? My week was wonderful. I got to meet with Betsy twice in preparation of today's talk. I That's had, great to hear. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Um, Alec, I, had, I met with her because I didn't want to see the exhibit through my <laughs> eyes. I wanted her to guide us. And so I'm hoping that we'll all get to know Betsy a little bit through some of the paintings she has chosen, her art and her stories. You know, she's 93, Alec, and yeah. she's strong, clear, and very much connected to her art. She yeah. also has loved going to the Met almost every day or every week throughout the retrospective. And we hope everyone here will also feel as connected to art as much as Miss Betsy after this event. So for this morning, we'll focus on the question, how does the artist depict reality? How do things go from looking like how we see them in real life into something like this? So the desire to depict life itself and capture what's around us is nothing new. We've been doing it for thousands of years, from cave paintings to the lifelike, lifelike sculptures of the Renaissance. And now we have photography and film. But there's something new every time, which is the artist's hand. Uh, Miss Denise, what are Miss Betsy's usual subjects? Alec, Betsy loves flowers, the ocean, the skies, sunsets, sunrises, and anything that captures her fancy and allows her to share her beauty with all of us. And she also allows us mm -hmm. to feel what she feels through her life's expression and experiences. I agree. Uh, things are filtered not only through the artist's eyes, but also the artist's experiences. Today, we'll take a look at various depictions of things in reality and examine what's going on there. Similar to Miss Betsy's art journey, the best place to start is with people, through portraits. The artist's way of representing not only people, but also identity, feeling, and emotion. Ms. Denise, can you show us the first one? I would love to. This self-portrait of Betsy was made while she lived in Madrid. She often donned a bandana when she was relaxed and carefree. In this early work, we can see her style is still evolving and is influenced greatly by classical Northern European styles. You will note that this portrait painted in 1965 includes more information than those that we will see in the next few minutes. The mood here is reflective and inquisitive with a little touch of tentativeness and uncertainty of life's future plans. I think it's interesting that there's a contrast here. Miss Betsy chose to depict herself in her most carefree and relaxed clothes. But if you look at the painting, it's dark. Even her face is under a shadow. There's barely any light. The mood of the painting isn't what her carefree, carefree clothes would suggest. I wonder why. That's a very good question, mm -hmm. Alec. Betsy shared that she did not really like this young version mm -hmm herself, as is often the case for many of us. There is a tendency to look at things with a very keen and sometimes critical eye, most especially of the self. If I may add for just a moment, Alec, this was also a tentative time in Betsy's life. She was a young mom with three girls and her husband had depression. So she was managing many, many things, more than meets the eye but your inquisitive eye has noticed that contrast in the darkness and the lightness of her clothes. Yeah, that's true. I'd like to ask a question to everyone. Like, imagine painting your own self-portrait. What would you wear? What personal items would you include? And how does this reflect who you are or what you're feeling? If you have time, 
sometime, take a look at your photo reel and your phones and review your history of selfies. Can you maybe glean what you were feeling at that point in your life? Miss Denise, did Betsy do a lot of self-portraits? I believe that Betsy rarely painted herself. So where we are really fortunate to have seen here in this retrospective, three portraits of Betsy at very distinct parts of her career as an artist and as a human being painted in a combination of acrylic and charcoal, we focus now at Betsy here at 85. She is beautiful, she is empowered, and she is restrained. Restraint, the ability to hold back and not reveal everything, is a quality that Betsy practices more often in her portraits than in her other types of painting. This portrait, stood at the opening of a wonderful exhibit at Manila Contemporary entitled Portrait of an Artist. It welcomed each visitor with a pause and a subtle introduction to the woman behind each framed sunset and sunrise that graced the gallery walls. Este retrato no tiene firma en el, en el museo, tienes que firmarlo. Okay. Portraits are a great way to capture ourselves in time and how our identity and self-perception evolves from then to now. Whereas in the younger self-portrait we just reviewed, wherein Betsy shared a dislike of herself, in this one, Betsy shared that this is a new version of herself. There is a bit of self-love in the way that she looks at herself. And I use the word self with a capital S as she comes to discover and understand herself more deeply. Add to that, one can sense a deep acceptance and surrender for all that has transpired in her life and all that will be. We spoke of this portrait together on Wednesday and I told her that I felt her strength and her great capability as a woman, as a wife, as a mother and as a friend. She looked at me with a most sweet smile and said that it was very beautiful to hear. There's a change to how she sees herself and it clearly shows in the two portraits painted 47 years apart. There's an obvious hint of a smile in the 2012 portrait with just a light touch of makeup visible to us. And I think by only choosing to really depict her face, it feels like there's a brilliant white light surrounding her. Or if you look at it in a certain way, it even feels like all that radiant light comes from Betsy herself. So even if the viewer doesn't get to speak with the artist, we only need to look at the self-portraits to get a sense of how the artist sees herself. Miss Betsy did a lot of portraits of other people too. Uh, Miss Denise, were you able to ask her why she loved doing it and what it meant to her, maybe? I did, Alec. When I asked why, she shared that she felt she was born to paint a portrait. Influenced greatly by an artist and a great aunt also named Betsy, portraits have always been very natural and an enjoyable process for her. Ash Betsy sits with her subject. She does her best to capture the feelings and the essence that she senses from them. What is important to her in that moment is that of time and connection. You will note that she pays attention to the subject's face over and above any other extraneous details that sometimes pull us away from that which she wants us to notice. The details are in the eyes and in the mouth and other parts of the face. And everything else is referenced in movements of mind with a lightness of touch. For example, in these two portraits, you have a staccato nature to ex express the shirt of this gentleman and then a more fluid and languid touch of her pastel to suggest the flourish and the edge of a beautiful blouse on the woman here. I think that really says a lot about Miss Betsy. 
when an artist paints a portrait of someone, it can also de- reflect the relationship between the artist and the subject. This is true. To sit for Betsy can be akin mm. to sitting with a friend because Betsy is very easy and congenial in nature. For Betsy, many of her subjects have become friends over time. And she looks back fondly <clears throat> of the memory of the time spent together. And oftentimes, Alec, she has shared that her friends are also her family. She has a very big group of friends that she holds very dear to her heart. So let's look for a moment at what a good portrait may be. It will be different for each of us, but I will share my perspective. For me, one good portrait is that it captures the essence and the sound resemblance of the subject. Strength, emotion, and character are prevalent in many of the portraits featured here. Apart from portraits, Miss Betsy is arguably most well known for painting flowers. What does painting flowers mean for her? I believe Betsy shared with me that flowers are another form of portraiture. They are a circle of friends. They bring her much joy, peace, beauty, and an effusiveness of life. Her floral paintings are very expressive. How does Miss Betsy capture flowers? You know, Alec, she depicts flora with care and accuracy because Betsy is a very good student of life. She's also a very good student of flowers with books on flora and fauna, and she's very tech savvy. She did also lots of research on the web. So what's unique about her depictions is the manner by which she creates a floral orchestra, which bursts forth from the frame with energy, vitality, and bold and colorful expressions. She intuitively pulls them together like a family and they coexist in splendor. You really can see that. Um, if I may share for a bit. Um, in art history, there's a rich tradition of painting flowers under the genre of still life. A still life is a painting or drawing of an arrangement of objects like fruits, flowers, bowls, and plates. But no matter how expressive and detailed these flowers are, you know they're dead and that eventually they will wilt away. I think it's really telling that Miss Betsy intentionally chose not to depict her flowers in vases or on top of tables. Uh, to our audience, would you say that these flowers will eventually wilt? Does it give you that sense? It doesn't look that way, right? And they can remind you of waterfalls even. Plus, they're surrounded by this background. And if you look closely, Miss Betsy didn't just choose to paint a solid flat color. She made the background like air flowing or even a softly rippling pond. Nothing looks still in this so-called still life. In fact, I don't think it's fair to call these paintings a still life. I feel that this is something else entirely. Miss Denise, what do you think? A lot of people really love Miss Betsy's flowers. What do you think they see and feel looking at these floral paintings? I'm actually excited to hear what the audience will have to share later on about how they feel about her paintings. I agree with you, Alec. There is nothing, um, still about these flowers. They have an energy that really is an extension of Betsy. And to also add to this point, for Betsy, she shares with us these beautiful things with a hidden message as well. The well-known writer and healer, Wayne Dyer, once said that nature is therapy. To step on a patch of grass, to connect with the earth, to see 
nature's innate beauty and abundance, plants, trees, and flowers, is then to quietly notice the body's ability to quickly find homeostasis and balance. This is the meaning of healing, to be at peace and in a state of calm, a state of sound body and mind and spirit. And these are the very reasons that Betsy's collectors gravitate towards her work. They bring that into their homes. And some of the collectors, I might add, who have shared their pieces in this exhibit said, oh, what will I do without my Betsy? while her work sits in the museum. I agree. Um, can you take us through more of Miss Betsy's nature paintings? Certainly. Let's move to the right where we see this series of beautiful tropical uh, gardens that Betsy has captured with her imagination of all things glorious in nature. In this particular one with the yellow birds of paradise in the foreground, these birds of paradise share space elegantly with beautiful Phalaenopsis orchids that bear their wily roots along with some very elegant and regal cymbidium. The star of the show is the birds of paradise. And Betsy loves this yellow. In fact, she spoke the other day about how it really pops out for her and has a lot of alegría, happiness. The birds of paradise are symbolic of bliss, life, joy. The white phalaenopsis up higher on the tree are symbolic of innocence and purity. And the cymbidium that are almost in a cascade-like array, a waterfall that you spoke of earlier, Alec, they exhibit the feelings of friendship, of value and respect. All of these aspects are what Betsy, as an artist and as a woman, hold dear to her heart. Let's just take a moment to enjoy that. I'd like to point out something, Alec, if you could pull in a little bit. The difference in this painting is also, she has placed them on a tree. A tree is very grounding. And also, if you notice how the plants are all nestled together, they really are in harmony with one another, like children around their mother. So now, Alec, We'll move over to the Hortensias. As we move across the gallery, we will move our focus to one of Betsy's favorite flowers called the hydrangea in English and Hortensias in Spanish. As with all things visual, there is symbolism to be revealed. The hydrangeas radiate abundance because of their many petals and bulbous shapes. It is sometimes known as mil fiore, which means a thousand flowers. Hydrangeas come in many colors and each color has its own meaning. From a deep longing of understanding between people, love and peace, to grace, beauty, and gratitude. What Betsy loves most about this painting is the marvelous combination of color. She especially delights in how the flowers are portrayed and the colors work well with the mixture of the background she specifically chose. Yet the other day, she wished for them to be more effusive and noticed and indeed they are. In her words, this is one of the most beautiful flower portraits I have painted. Hydrangeas are most special to Betsy, for they are abundant in her garden of her family home in Aravaca, Spain, 
a place where she has a range of memories from childhood to the present. Lush, colorful, and beautiful, the hydrangea exports easily transports Betsy and in some way walks with her in the mill-petaled complex nature of this particular botanical and that of her life. We'll move now to two powerful paintings across the gallery. They have the same exuberant of color and lushness in the hydrangea painting, but now they are in honor of the tropical orchid which Betsy fell in love with many years ago. The first is a plethora of orchids bursting off the canvas from an unknown source, which while the second has a more quiet resplendence grounded by the maternal presence of a large tree from which everything grows and flows. One is from an unknown source and the other from a tree. Both are depictions of the higher power that exists in the universe. There are over 25,000 species and over 100,000 varieties of orchids, and they too have symbolism, love, beauty, fertility, refinement, thoughtfulness, and charm, many of which are qualities that best describe Betsy. Betsy is intimate in her knowledge of the nuances of the many orchids that appear in her paintings from Vandas to Phalaenopsis, Cymbidiums to Oncidiums, and they dance together like one expansive and happy family. They energize the viewer as they have energized Betsy. I do feel that way in a sense. And I remember in the biography video of Miss Betsy, she talks about someone commenting on these paintings saying, they're only flowers. And Miss Betsy replies, why say only flowers? Flowers are one of the most beautiful creatures in the world. I think I have to agree with Miss Betsy here. I think that people sometimes easily dismiss flower paintings because they're just decorative but it's only decorative depending on the eye looking at it. That unnamed viewer failed to go in deeper, I think. Just as you showed us, Miss Denise, I feel that Miss Betsy saw flowers as full of life and symbolism and with the potential to heal too. So we see here, this is the artist not only painting her reality, but also her experience of it. To one person, it's just decor but to her it's meaningful and it really shows. And since she painted it, we get to take part in that reality. We get to share this with the artist too. You know, I was also like the only flowers guy at the start. That's why I think it's important to just stop for a moment when you look at art. I always stop myself from doing a snap a picture and go. I find that I begin to see only in moments when I dwell. And speaking of, there's plenty of art left to see. Uh, Ms. Denise, if you may continue. I will continue, but I also mm -hmm. want to hover on something you've just touched mm -hmm. on, Alec. The tendency for all of us to quickly judge a situation or judge what we see. And you're so right. It's only in the moments, as you said, Alec, that when we dwell, that when we pause, that we can really start to see the small things around us and the messages they have to convey. I like your reflection, Alec, and I like that you have changed your perspective over time. So we're gonna move now. We're going to go under the sea. This is a Mindoro landscape. It was painted from Betsy's memory when she would go to an island in Palawan to snorkel. 
I'd like to say, shall we have a little adventure with this painting? It was painted over a period of two years, from 1981 to 1983. In this retrospective, this painting is placed before we enter the Metz Tall Gallery, which is where we just were. So we've just pulled back a moment to sort of reassess things. This piece is quite special and unique as Betsy has not often painted below the earth's surface. She has one or two other shell paintings in the exhibit, but this one is of grander scale. Betsy as an artist is always inclined to paint all that she sees with a beautiful perspective. And so too with these corals, shells, and the water's colorful movements. Here beneath the waters, the colors of the corals are in pastel shades, slightly muted, slightly soft. And I'd like also just to touch for a moment on the point that um, you made earlier, Alec, about the background, that it could have been just flat but it is not. And now we go to the coral, which is its own messenger. Coral is said to have sacred properties and is symbolic of happiness, immortality, wisdom, and modesty. Look carefully at this painting as we play a little. At the foreground, you have a large shell nestled close by smaller ones, all tucked in to a somewhat softly defined coral bed. The key word here is softly defined because the future is like that. We do not know what it brings. We are not in control of what is to come. You can see references in this painting of Betsy's plants and clouds even the splashes of the same colors that we saw earlier in the birds of paradise with orange and a bit of yellow. And also in the movements of the coral, which are very similar to the movements in the orchids. You see here the swirls. Betsy, sorry, loves colors and she knows them all by love and by name. They are her friends too. You see the swirls of the current, the same energy that moves in all her art, the same energy that moves through her being when she creates. And there, there in the middle of the painting, if you squint your eyes ever so slightly, you may see a silhouette of a woman, almost like the back of a classical statue. See what you can see for a moment. Notice what you notice. I'll give you a few moments just to play. Now let's look further and see if you notice that in front of the figure, is a small white cat piece, rectangular piece, which almost appears to be the part of an illumined canvas. There she sits beneath the sea in a lovely sense of safety and sweetness, like that of being in a state of waiting for what will come forth next on her canvas of life, on her canvas of light. I see it. Thanks for taking us on that journey into the painting. And speaking of light, how has Betsy depicted the Philippine sunset? That is a great question because that is what Betsy is also so well known for. She holds dear in her heart the very special ritual of taking in the sunset at the end of a work day with her beloved husband, Antonio Brias. They would hold hands 
and taken the beauty that was like a live canvas stretched across Rojas Boulevard. Sadly, he passed away, leaving Betsy with three daughters for whom to watch over. We'll now move through the gallery and look at some of her other paintings. Betsy once shared that with all the challenges that life brings, she paints pain away. In her words, painting has saved me from a lot of pain. When I paint, I forget about everything else. She once shared that she finds peace in painting. Sometimes when there's a big problem, I start painting. After a while, I say to myself, I think I had a big problem, but now I don't know which one it was. To watch her paint is to witness her pull from her soul with an ease of expression. Betsy has depicted sunsets and sunrises in a most profound way, capturing the essence of both the sunrise and the sunset a very few have been able to do. With every new day of life comes hope. And with every close of a day, we are reminded of life's impermanence. Betsy has lived and breathed thousands of Philippine sunsets and sunrises from the first time she set foot in our country. And she has breathed in a thousand more in her vast imagination and love for the distinct qualities of the Philippine sunset. She shared that while Spanish friends may have invited her to paint from their balconies in Spain, she declined politely for her connection to the Philippines, its friendships, sunrises and sunsets are so deeply connected to her being. The ocean is often referred to as the abode of the subconscious, the unknown, emotions and feelings. Here lie the hidden depths of the soul and things that one day come to the surface. It is also symbolic of power, life, mystery, strength, truth and hope. The ocean has no beginning and no end and is a place where we can easily become lost so that we may be found and discover the expansiveness of ourselves and our lives. I know that it has also been said that the ocean is where the tears of the divine lie. So we shall now hover over this painting for a little while, while I share with you that Betsy said, this is the time when light has gone. Let's just stay here for a while, Alec, in a little bit of quiet so the audience can take in the painting. So we have moved now away from things more defined like portraits and flowers and details to the abstract journey of the artist. It's an evolution. It happens over time. And the sunsets and sunrises have been a part of Betsy's dialogue with us as viewers for a very long time. When Betsy says, this is the time where the light has gone, Betsy is a student of light. She knows exactly where the light comes in and when the light goes out. For her, the essence of light remains in the reflection in the skies 
and upon the ocean. In this painting, she is using a combination of colors not often seen in her other landscape. They are of ultramarine blue, which is both of water and of sky, and raw amber, which she has put as the ocean, but we can also interpret as the earth, as the, the groundedness of where we stand. In her combining the two in this way, it gives a sense of the skies and the ocean rolling powerfully, nearing the land at whose edge we stand. So now we move to this painting on the right. And let's come in a little bit closer, Alec, just for all of us to take in the art. This one, Betsy calls Edge of Darkness. At this image, she shares that the sun has gone and has left only its reflection behind. For her, this has the feeling of watching the day come to a close and savoring the very last ray of light that the day has brought. I love how she speaks. I love how she watches. You spoke earlier, Alec, about taking a moment to watch things. And this is what an artist does. They are observers of life. They notice things that other people may be too busy to see or may not yet be ready to see. Betsy speaks both literally and metaphorically. On the horizon, one can see boats of many shapes, of many forms, vessels that move us around while we are here on the planet, and in this case, on the water. Some of the boats may look recent, while others look as though they have appeared from another time in history. Why don't we take a few minutes just to write down some feelings or even think about how this painting touches you and just take a minute or two to just capture a couple of words and see what insight they may bring you later. What does the blue mean to you? What does the white mean to you? What does the yellow mean? They each have different meanings for the eyes that look at them. So we'll stay here for another minute to give you some time. If I may, I think I see a mermaid in the foreground. Lovely. Yeah. And fun for everyone to do later on, after we finish our talk, Google mermaid mm -hmm. and the symbolism of it. Because collectively in this group, we can see things together and we may actually have clues that are important for each of us to hear at this time. Alec, would you mind for a moment that we would move to the painting to the left of this, the one we saw earlier, just to give our sure. audience a little bit more time to do a little bit of reflection for themselves and appreciate the art. Here we are back at this lovely painting of Betsy's. I'd like to invite you to look at what the sky looks like to you. Might you see a celestial being, 
Somebody shared that they saw a horse to the left. Another one that the white edge in the sky looked like the edge of an angel wing. What do you see? How do you feel? What does the white mean to you? Is there a message for you? What does the blue say to your spirit? And what does the amber of this painting beckon you to hear for yourself? It's lovely to see people sharing their thoughts down below on the chat. And now let us move. Are we ready? Shall we go together? Let's go see Betsy's magnificent seascapes and cloudscapes. The late Elena Flores, the distinguished Spanish critic, christened this body of work, Atmosferografias which means to describe the atmosphere and its qualities. But how does one begin to describe the undescribable? Our esteemed Philippine art critic, Sid Reyes, so beautifully coins this part of the retrospective, honoring Elena Flores's word choice, followed by his definition, atmosferografias the search for celestial space. I think it's also important to take note that Miss Betsy made a deliberate choice to focus on our Philippine skies and cloudscapes. In, in art history, when artists paint the landscape, they treat the sky as only a part of it. But with Miss Betsy, this is again the artist showing to us her reality and her experience of the landscape. When we usually draw the sunset, there's the horizon, there's the ground, or there's the sea. But Miss Betsy decided to look up and the sky filled her vision and captured her. And that's what she painted. What do you think, Miss Denise? I think you're right, Alec. I think you're right in saying that it filled her vision and captured her. It makes me think for a moment of what happens to each of us when life gets a little troubling. Do we sometimes look up at the sky? Do we sometimes plea and talk out loud and ask why? Why is this happening to me? Or what is the answer to my question? So I shall pause at this time to express as we come in closer to these three atmosferografias and observe how Betsy has moved through her various cycles of life, her numerous calls to adventure, for every challenge is not a challenge, but a call to adventure and how she arrives at the portal of undefining that which has been so well defined. Perhaps we can sense that this body of work is indeed a visual, celestial and spiritual epiphany expressed in different feelings, movements and a profusion of colors that move the viewer from the inside outside pulling us from the, from the security of the coral seabed to the groundedness of the earth made of plants and people and places. And now we go all the way up, up, up into the celestial skies. Here we are at Atmosferica, the warren on the left. of the last wall in the gallery. 
selecting whites, cobalt blues, and Betsy's favorite cadmium red, which she has told me she used both, all three, light cadmium red, medium cadmium red, and dark cadmium. She was so cute to share the colors from her tubes. Betsy said of this ethereal atmospherica that she feels in her words, I am inside the painting. And perhaps she is indeed inside this painting. And maybe also in each and every painting that she has ever created, leaving upon each canvas a little part of herself. And so too, with every individual who has come and chosen to connect with her through her art, through her love, and through her friendship in this lifetime. I actually invite you, the audience, for a moment to feel right now in your heart what Betsy actually may have gifted you with so far. And you can always come back later to the virtual tour and hover and be there for a while. Because it is not so much that we have to own a painting to have a part of the artist. We can also have a part of the artist in our own being by just appreciating what she has shared, almost like a conversation with her. This painting leaves me in wonder and awe at the, as the diaphanous clouds of spirit, and I say here capital S in white, dance with the emotions of cadmium red's love and passion and cobalt blue's cool connection to sky and water. Let's stay here, Alec, for a few minutes to allow the audience to see what they may see and take note of any words or feelings that pop up while you look at this and write them down. They are sometimes little clues for our own growth and discovery. We'll be here for about another 30 seconds to a minute. Okay. Alex, let's move across to the painting on the right for a moment. And maybe allow artists, maybe allow the audience, um, maybe go back to the middle one, just to take a look at that. We won't be talking too much, but just to have time to hover with this piece. This piece has an almost a dialogue between the blues and the whites and the oranges in a much more powerful way. It almost looks to me like a bit of a blue volcano with white and orange erupting from its mouth. But it is the clouds. And this is the beauty of clouds is that we can always play with our imagination to see what we need to see. And now we'll move over to the one on the right as we close and pull back a little bit to see it in its glory. We close with this painting from which Danny Alvarez, our esteemed, wonderful, sensitive and intuitive curator, curator christened the retrospective passages. 
he pulled and culled these beautiful works along with the Met Museum's devoted and dedicated team under these very interesting times of 2020 and 2021. It is said that at the greatest moments of challenge await the revelation of the greatest amount of light. I'm gonna repeat that for a moment. And maybe if you have your pen and paper, you'd like to take notes on that because we all have our challenges and we all get through them. For this too shall come to pass. It is said that the greatest moments of challenge await the revelations of the greatest amounts of light. And it could be said for this entire exhibit and also this time in history where we in, wherein we have all been stretched, stretched to discover the essential in our lives, the essential gifts of light and love in our hearts and in our spirits and to get to know ourselves and our minds. Together, we are no longer focusing on me, but we are we. And together, we are all making the impossible possible. Here, Betsy showed us how she painted away the pain. The clouds are powerful. Reds, cadmium, blues, cobalt, azure, ultramarine, all of Betsy's favorites powerfully telling us of her pain, but with so much beauty and elegance and even restraint, the restraint to convey the beauty of her celestial scapes. Here Betsy shows us how she painted away the pain in this powerful expression of love, deep, deep love and deeper and more painful loss. And in the midst of many tumultuous emotions and feelings that she has endured, not just at that moment, but throughout life, throughout her life. And then we'll come in a little closer and we notice that there is a horizon marked a little bit by that bright yellow swash of color for all below that is a reflection of the skies in the water. And above that is a dark circular hole, if you will. In this dark circle in the center, it is almost like a portal, a tunnel that connects all of us with this world and in this moment of time. Betsy said, in this tunnel, my daughter went. This moment in time, Betsy has invited us to be transported, to discover what lies in the celestial spaces and realms of the atmosferografias of her life as coined by her friend, Elena, thank you. Thank you, Miss Denise. There's something clearly otherworldly and beyond with her atmospherographias. And as Miss Isabel, Miss Isabel shared in the chat, there is a force behind the skies. Now we want to open the floor to more dialogue and questions to our group. We saw and felt that the artist is clearly in her paintings and that we can connect to a part of her every time we look at her art. For everyone joining the conversation, how can you see yourself or your experiences in Betsy's own experiences and in her works? You can share with us via the chat or if you want to speak, just let us know in the chat and we'll make space for you to open your mic. But while we wait for uh, questions and reactions, we have a question from Nikki pertaining to this 
painting you talked about and the painting from which this exhibit was named after in continuing the idea of connecting with the artist through the art we can say that we can carry her notion of transporting ourselves or passing through realms to overcome our personal pains. What is this realm for you? And how do you bounce back from difficult times? And maybe we can also ask everyone the same question for them to reflect upon. Thank you for that question, Nikki. I like to think that the celestial realm is where all the questions go and where all the answers lie. And I take for a moment to define celestial realm because it will be different for each of us. We will all have our own definition of something greater than ourselves. Some will call it God. Some will call it the divine mother or the divine father. Some will say the creator. Some will be comfortable with higher power. Whatever it is, it's all perfect. So I bounce back. How? I bounce back from difficult times by pausing, allowing, and acknowledging the difficult times. Not to deny them, because they are real to me in that moment. I reflect, I breathe, I heal through them. And then I reach out also, and I allow those who also want to reach out to me to converse they are lifelines and we all need them. So when I have a chat, I am grounding and I am speaking of things that trouble my heart. And when my heart is troubled, it's because my heart wants me to look at something because the body knows, the body keeps the score and the body is telling us to slow down and to listen so we can recalibrate and speaking earlier so we can find balance and homeostasis. My father always says that with all things in life, things can be talked through. This is an important thing to share and speak about, especially now, as we see how the challenges of the pandemic has affected everybody in some way or form. Betsy's art reminds us of the importance of taking care of our minds and our mental health. She processed herself through her art. We will all find our own processes. It is our birthright and it is necessary. Thank you, Miss Denise. Going back to her two self-portraits before, in her younger self, we noted that she was carefree but disliked herself. And there was a lot of uncertainty there. Where do you think that's coming from. Alec, I think it may have come from not knowing if she had made the right decision. When her parents expressed mm -hmm. their concern in her marrying her husband, knowing that life would have its fair share of challenges. What challenges? Think, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go. Uh, I think that's something we can all relate to. Uh, a lot of our uh, audience viewers in this group has been sharing uh, pain and turmoil that we have felt during uh, this crisis. Um, but may I ask, what challenges did Miss Betsy face adjusting to the new life ahead of her back then? I don't think Betsy had any idea of how life would unfold. I don't think any of us really do. And she did it to the best of her ability. She juggled, as with all women, to find a balance in the many roles that life would give her and grace her with. She is and was then a creative and prolific artist. And imagine having this passion to create, but also having to set aside that time to be caregiver to her husband as his condition worsened, and the challenges that are part of being married, and also to keep the family together. We all want to have a moment to breathe, and Betsy breathed through her art. 
it's a lot to manage life and it can be very overwhelming. But she kept on going, doing her best to live and also an important point to mention, her best to cope. I think it's Women's Month now and I think a lot of women can also relate having to do the balancing balancing act between their domestic and familial duties um, and their personal pursuits. Um, I'd like to ask the audience, uh, would you have any questions for us now before we close? And I'd like to highlight a comment from Nikki. She says that perhaps we can say that Miss Betsy has reached a state of calm, which can now inform how she felt empowered in her 2012 portrait. And like you said, finding peace and serenity is what gravitated people to Betsy's flora. That's one of the reasons. And this can be an affirmation that all of us as well are trying to find our own sense of peace too. And I guess that's something art can do. All right, before we end, remember we asked you in the registration forms what your expectations are for this event. And I'd like to briefly share what Rosemary Rosales wrote. She said that she wants to learn other ways on how artists express their skills in art to depict the reality of life. So today we saw the reality of one artist's life and life is different for each of us, but we live and share in the same earth. And no matter how different our lives are, there are certain things, the important ones that resonate from one person to the next that we feel transcends time and difference. So this morning we looked at the way Miss Betsy saw what is and how she colored her life accordingly. So we're really happy that we are able to experience this together. Art indeed can help us make sense of the world around us, but only if we look closely. And close looking is not just about find, it's not about finding hidden meanings in artworks. That's not what we did today. What we did is improving the quality of attention we're giving into the work. And art is not just something to look at or just absorb. Art is also something to talk about in relation to our lives and in relation to ourselves. So art is both intimate and shared. There's so many ways to look at art and we hope that this activity helps you have a more enriching experience every time you look at something. Even if it's not art, even if it's just the things around you. Miss Denise, before we go, would you like to share something before we leave? Maybe a pabaon to the group. Sure, I would leave to, love to leave a pabaon to the group, Alec. I would like to take this time to remind us of Betsy's underlying message in her art, that of nature, wherein we can find and we can lose ourselves, lose and find ourselves, and that of hope, to always, always be hopeful in much the same way that nature is hopeful. Every day, the sun comes up, bringing with it possibility and creativity and an opportunity to serve. And every day, it goes down, giving us time to reflect and to take note of what we can do to continue to evolve and to be the best versions of ourselves and most importantly, to be the best versions for others. And here's a little gift back to you from Betsy, a little secret. Betsy is a very kind and generous woman, quietly assisting and supporting many strangers and friends along the way in their own times of challenge. She has shared through her life the key to unlocking the locks in the hearts of many. This is the real meaning of life, to be of service, to share ourselves with one another, 
in the same way that she has shared her voice to help all of us heal and celebrate love, life, and nature. Alec, you're mute, my dear. Whoops. <laughs> so thanks for joining us, everyone. And check your chat box for relevant links. Kindly fill up the evaluation form, especially if you want to receive an e-certificate. We'd love to hear from you all, and it will help us do even better in our next programs. And if you'd like to stay for a bit and chat with us, please feel free to do so. And if you want, you can... Uh, turn on your cameras and audio and we can say hi to each other. So thanks again and you know where to find us. Hi, Mom Alec. Hi. <laughs> the last time I saw you was a week after that. It uh -huh. was the... <laughs> the... It was the... <laughs> What do you call this? Uh, the lockdown. <laughs> Remember last oh. last year, you mm -hmm. we had our uh, see, uh, no, uh, we had Arte our Pobre tour us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice to yeah. see you again. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> yeah. And we hope this simulates na parang we're also in the Met. <laughs> Alec, Denise. Yes. Hi, Sir Manny. It was like art appreciation also uh, with uh, meditation because you can better appreciate art when you really are mindful about what it is you're appreciating. But it also okay. kind of helps you to connect to your soul. So it's quite a wonderful experience to, um, to have mindfulness and also connecting to Betsy's art and also connecting Betsy's art with our soul. Thank you yeah. for the morning. Denise, Alec. Yes. Thank you for uh, this beautiful, enlightening morning. And uh, we thank everyone who joined this morning's session of Art Inspires. I think it is a very beautiful way of launching our new series for our audiences. Thank you again, Denise. Thank you, Tina, for the gift. I had so much fun. Um, I felt like I went back to school under your your nudge. And uh, Alec was so much uh, fun to work with. I appreciated also time with Nikki and the whole team. But um, it, was, it was like going back to school to prepare. And I loved every moment of it. Thank you for the grace, Tina. Wonderful insights. Very, very enlightening. Thank you. Thank you, Alec. Thank you. Thank you, Alec. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Miss Denise. Thank you. Thank you to the Thank host. you, Miss Denise. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Gidget, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mom Denise. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Thank you, Denise and Alec. Thank you for attending. Thank you. And spending the morning with us. It was very enlightening. It's so nice to hear what the audience, how, how they respond. For sure. One of the reasons why we wanted this format is also to simulate like a small group tour, like for just being in the museum. Because I think that's a lot of, uh, that's, a thing, that's an experience a lot of people miss. So yeah. And, it, and uh, Alec, it may even be the case where, you know, um, this recording will be available for other people who may not be able to take advantage of the last day of Monday's yeah. live visit, right? People can come here. For the yeah. Where will the link um, be for them? Can they find it on the, the recording? Um, not yet. So the way Zoom recording works is that Zoom processes it first, 
and then afterwards we'll download it and see how the recording is review it then afterwards we'll make it available in youtube and facebook just our regular channels Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Miss Denise. And I see that some of our guests are still here. So we'll just leave this room open for five more minutes. So if you'd like to share something, now is the time. Hi, Alec. Hi, Dan. Maybe we can acknowledge Ms. Um, Carmen, who is here um, today with us. Uh, hi, Ms. Carmen. Can you hear us? So to our audience, Ms. Carmen Rias is the daughter of Betsy Westendorf, who we have worked closely with to make this exhibition a reality. So thank you, Ms. Carmen, for joining. Hi, Ma'am Alec. Uh, yeah, hi. Yes, can I ask Dawn. one? Can I ask one of the daughters of the artist? Mm -hmm. Is that possible? Uh, I would just like to ask, uh, what? How does it feel being a a daughter of an artist? Miss Carmen, are you there? And. Maybe she's still waiting. Yeah. But Don, thank you for that question. We'll send um we'll send that to Miss Carlin and maybe we can get back to you. Um we'll send you a message. We have your um contact information. Yeah. Um Alec? Yes, sir, Manny. Dina, Denise, I just wanted to thank you. It was so intimate and so delicate um, because it prepared our eyes and our hearts to also view Betsy's paintings with such um, a quiet space. It was such a lovely experience. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, Manny, for making all of this a reality. Oh, Thank no, you, please. Man. No, Thank please, you, no. my darling. Yeah. No, please, no. The Met team, everything. And while we have our friends online, the last day for the Betsy Westendorf retrospective at the Metropolitan Museum is on Monday. Um, if they're interested, they can call the Met, but we will only take, you know, um, just a few appointments if they want to actually physically go to the show because of social distancing. Uh, and that will be um, the last day is on Monday. So um, we just want to thank everyone um, for their support for Betsy's uh, art and to uphold her legacy in the times and the years to come. Thank you, Alec, for this wonderful program. Tina, thank you so much. Denise, you are a wonderful uh, commentator. Thank you. And all our friends for joining today. So thanks again, everyone, for spending your Saturday morning with us. So just two more minutes and then, oh, just one more minute. We'll close this room at 11.24. But you. if you have... Uh, yes, go. Thank you, everybody. It's so, so lovely. I made a copy of the comments so we can re re reflect on, on them and learn from them. Yeah. 
Thanks again, everyone. And if you still want to send us messages, you can message our Facebook page or contact us through our email, info at netmuseum.ph. And if you have any messages for the artist, you can also email it to us and we'll be compiling all of them and sending to her. Bye, Alec. Thank you so much. Bye, Bye yes. everybody. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Matt. Thank yes. you, all of you, for just doing a beautiful job and staying steady from yeah. wherever you are. Thank you, Miss Denise. Hope you have a great weekend. You too. Thank you, Alec. Wonderful, wonderful job. Thanks for pulling it off. It's Thank all you. you. <laughs> no, it's all of us. Remember, it's all we. Me. <laughs> okay. Bye. Take Thank care. You. Thank you.